Good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to be here and talk to you about gender and education and more specifically in the Flemish context. Um, so the first thing we could ask ourselves is especially in Belgium, where people tend to think, okay, emancipation happened like decades ago. Is there actually still a problem? Um, so to do that, it's important to actually study um, Flanders as a context and to put sometimes things into an international perspective. So first of all, I will take you through some numbers about gender and education in Belgium. So first of all, when we are looking at some numbers, we see that boys in Belgium tend to repeat a year a lot more often than girls do. So we have about 30% of girls repeating a year by the end of their school career and over 40% of boys. Um, we also see uh, a larger uh, amount of boys that um, tend to drop out without a qualification. So they stop their school career without um, getting a diploma. That's 18% 18, 18 versus 11% among girls in Belgium. Uh, we also see that boys tend to be overrepresented in special education. So at age 11, we see that about a third more boys are present in special education than girls are. So they are sent to special education more easily than girls. And we also see that uh, when we consider general education, so the ASO, the track that prepares you for higher education, we see that girls are over or more represented there than boys. And of course, this translates into their presence in higher education, where over 65% of girls are continuing studies, whereas it's only around 55% for boys. So we do see that boys tend to, on a lot of different parameters that uh, we use to look for academic success, tend to be doing more poorly. And interestingly, we find across Europe similar trends. So it's not that Belgium is a very specific case in this, but it's something that really pops out. Why? Because usually as gender researchers and when we are talking about gender, we usually talk about how women tend to have the short end of the stick. And when we look at it in education, it stands out that it's the reverse and that the situation tends to be uh, quite different in the sense that it's this time boys that are doing more poorly than girls. So it's something that kind of grabs your attention. However, it's still important to see it in a global level and that's also why uh, I'm very happy that Madeleine is here today to talk to us because, of course, um, in that respect, we are just a small part of the world. So even though girls are outperforming boys in education in Belgium and in Europe, when we consider the spatial dimension and look at the world globally, we see that that's not true. So we had the, the numbers that Madeleine already uh, presented for us, and it's definitely true that we see that millions of girls are attending school less on a global level than boys are. So this is something to always keep in mind. Um, with regards to um, the Western world or with regards to Europe and Belgium, we also see that this overrepresentation of girls is also a recent phenomenon. So it's not something that's been going on for a very long time, but rather we see with the expansion of education in the 20th century and with the emancipation that we see that girls are attending school in higher numbers throughout um, the 20th century. And depending on the level of education, the later you go, the more girls are picking up. So it was by 69 that we had an equal representation for 14 to 15 year olds. And it took until the 80s to have an equal representation in higher education. However, this trend has continued to grow. And that means that nowadays we have a higher representation of girls in higher education than boys. Um, because of this shift because we started to see that girls were participating in equal or even higher numbers than girls, attention of researchers shifted. So before we tended to focus mostly on participation because that's a very clear indicator of the access to education and how people are doing. But once we had equal 
participation, the attention shifted to participation. How are things going throughout the school career? That's when we started considering uh, GPA, so grade point averages or the scores that people get on a test, uh, study, study attitudes and school behavior. And when we start to consider these things, we see some other interesting things popping up. So we saw that the boys were underrepresented in education and tended to do worse on a lot of indicators of academic achievement. But when we start to consider study attitudes and school behavior, this even becomes more clear. So we see that boys tend to have more negative school attitudes. They tend to be less motivated to study, spend less time on homework, are more inattentive and disruptive in the class, and tend to attribute their success, their academic success, not to hard work, but to talent. And what we see is that these collection of study attitudes and school behavior do tend to explain the difference in academic success between boys and girls. Okay, but you can look at these things and then wonder, why do boys behave this way? And quite interestingly, why is this only starting in secondary education? So if we want to explain where this behavior is coming from, then it's important to consider gender in a more broad perspective. So when we talk about gender, we're not just talking about women and men and about the differences that are there in between the sexes, but we're also considering how gender norms are influencing us on an everyday basis in a lot of ways. So for instance, when we talk about gender expression, the way you behave in your everyday life, it's about clothing, it's about the way you talk, it's about the way you walk, it's about the interests you have, the hobbies you pursue, the job you eventually tend to have. All these things tend to have a certain level of femininity or masculinity that are that is attributed to it in our society and there are certain aspects of behavior that we would classify as more masculine and as more feminine and these things have an impact on us in our everyday lives uh, quite interestingly, we see that uh, when it comes to the different aspects of gender, adolescents tend to be uh, an important exp exploration period where students and children are really starting to think about who am I? What do I want to do with my life? Who do I want to be? Who are the people that are like me and that I want to associate with? So these are things that are very much going on and that also... Um, make our schools important sites of action because all these processes are going on right under our noses. So like I was saying, so we have some uh, norms that are um, deemed more masculine and a stereotypical way, of course, and more feminine. And what's quite interesting is when we think about some things that we would deem especially feminine, such as being tidy, being punctual, being cooperative and obedient, these are things that also tend to match what teachers would like their classrooms to be. They would like their students to be tidy, punctual, hand in your homework on time and don't make a mess of it, but make it very nice and clear. Use uh, the different colors, use your ruler to draw a line, etc. Uh, when you're in class, it's fun that you're working in a cooperative way. It's fun that you're obedient, so you're silent when I'm asking you to be silent, etc., etc. So these are actually a lot of characteristics that we stereotypically would say are more feminine that are at the same time more uh, pro-school or are more fitted to the things that we want stereotypically to be present in our pupils. On the other hand, we see that some of the characteristics that we would say are more stereotypically masculine, such as being athletic, being rebellious, tough, cool, etc., tend to be the things that also attribute to a more anti-academic school culture, where students try to challenge the teacher, be the cool person, have a laugh in class, etc., etc. And these things are not necessarily very conducive to a good teacher-student relationship. So what we actually see going on um, in secondary education, when the peers are becoming more and more important, we see that there are school cultures that start to arise. So we see that boys, they tend to have um, 
groups of friends where image and coolness is an important factor. And we see that the things that contribute to your coolness is not doing a good job at school, but about, it's about being the cool guy, it's about being the funny one, it's about doing well in sports and being popular with the girls. Um, and what we see is that when, as a boy, you are transgressing these expectations or these norms, there's bullying that ensues. And we see that boys are actively trying to balance their school achievement with the masculinity culture in their peer groups, where they try, because of course they do realize that school is important. So what we see, for instance, is that um, well achievers, so boys that do very well in school, at the same time will try to balance by also being good in sports or being the class clown and making a lot of jokes, or by looking very disinterested in the classroom, but at the same time still getting the high marks. Uh, what we also see is the culture of effortless attainment. Uh, what do we mean by that? Is uh, that a culture of effortless attainment refers to um, the way that boys would frame their achievements. So it's not that they spend three hours studying on the test that they were going to have and look at it, they scored an A. No, no, it's just, I'm so talented and look at it, I scored an A and I didn't even do anything. So it's also a strategy that helps you out in several ways because by claiming that you didn't work for something, if you fail, this failure is not an indication of your lack of talent, it's just an indication of your lack of work. So it's a double way of um, protecting your image. On the other hand, we see with girls that they tend to have more the best friend forever uh, groups in high school, where they tend to have more intimate one-on-one -on -one relationships. And we also see that for girls, um, pro-school behavior tends to be more accepted, tends to be less socially uh, punished. And that is some of the things that helps our boys and our girls in school to behave in certain ways that might or might just hinder their academic achievement. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Casper and Hobbes. Um, so what we see here, for instance, um, it's, a, it's a nice representation of how these things uh, work, but in a comedic way. So Casper asked uh, his friend, so what grade did she get? And she said, I have an A. And he went, oh, I'd hate to be you, I got a C. And so his friend is very puzzled about it, about why he would want to see, and he says, I find my life is a lot easier the lower I keep everyone's expectations. Um, to come back to this gender-bred person and about those gender norms uh, I've just been discussing, of course, there's a time effect. Um, and this is also a very nice thing because it implies that change is possible. So these gender norms, of course, are not fixed. They're also different across time and space. So if you just think about it, um, a skirt for us, we consider a skirt to be very feminine. But if you would ask a Scotsman in the 17th century, he would, of course, very much disagree because a kilt is the epitome of masculinity. So we see that the norms on what masculinity and femininity entail, that they are are changeable and that they are different across time and space. Quite an interesting thing that has been happening in our uh, in Europe or in the Western world is that we see that the gender norms for women are opening up. So due to the emancipation that we've been having in the 20th century, we see that it has become more acceptable for women to also adopt more stereotypically masculine characteristics or um, interests or uh, behaviors. Uh, so for instance, it has become very normal for a woman to wear trousers, to go out to work, to be ambitious, um, to say what you think uh, and be assertive. Um, so we see that these more stereotypically masculine things have become more and more normal and accepted for women. On the other hand, we don't see the same broadening of gender norms for men. So at the same time that the gender norms has been opening up for women, for men this has not been uh, true to the same extent because adopting stereotypically more feminine characteristics and behaviors is still less deemed worthy in our society. So if you just consider the difference between a woman going out to work, she's uh, regarded as somebody, she's making her money, she has a profession, it's something to respect. Whereas a man that decides to stay at home and take care of the family is still something that is still quite 
uh, rare in our society and at the same time something that is not necessarily um, celebrated. Um, these things are also quite interesting in the reaction that our society gives to what we would call such gender norm transgressions. So when we consider, for instance, a girl that plays soccer, we would maybe go like, oh, okay, that's an that's a unusual choice, but cool. Nice. However, if you would just think about a boy that goes to ballet, the most regular um, reaction you would probably get is, hmm, he might be gay. And that's the second thing that is very interesting about these gender norms, is the way that gender norm transgressions are linked to sexual orientation. So what we see is that when people... Um, do something that is considered cross-gender, cross at the same time their sexual orientation will be questioned. And it's also vice versa true, when we hear that somebody is gay, we will at the same time consider that they might be effeminate when they're a, a guy, or that they might be butch when they're a woman. So it's a, a very interesting um, way that the two are conflated in the way our society thinks about it. And it also means that when we are discussing uh, LGBT rights, it has a very clear link to gender norms because they are so tightly interwoven. And the issues that um, LGBT people uh, face are usually um, a kind of um, magnifying way of how our gender norms are working. So that is also why today I want to also spend some time on discussing LGBT um, aspects in our education. So for instance, when we are looking at the teacher attitude, our teacher attitudes, uh, we see that our teachers in Belgium, they tend to think rather progressively. And we see with regards to gender and LGBT that they are super positive. Uh, especially when we compare it to attitudes about students with an ethnic minority background or who have a lower socioeconomic background or who have a disability, we see that the attitudes toward LGBT students tend to be the most positive. So that's definitely a good thing to hear and see. Um, however, we have to always be a bit careful with only uh, considering attitudes because we do notice in Belgium that there is a very clear discrepancy between the attitudes of the teachers on the one hand and their practices in the classroom on the other. So while they are very positive about LGBT uh, issues, at the same time they indicate that they don't feel very competent to talk about LGBT issues or gender norms in the classroom. So I think this also very clearly links to what Madeleine said about sex and how it's a taboo subject. Even in our society today, we still see this happening. So for instance, 85% of students says they have not or been wrongly informed about LGB sexuality at school. And we see that our teachers are reporting these low competence. So when we're talking about how would you handle a trans student in your classroom, 30 to 50% say, I have a lot of questions about it. But even about working in gender sensitive ways or maybe handling sexism happening in your classroom that you might consider more usual topics, we still see that a quarter to the half of the teacher population says, I'm not really sure how to handle these things. Quite a notable aspect there is that we see a very clear divide across uh, educational levels. So we see that these questions are mostly pronounced in primary education um, rather than in secondary education. One of the reasons for this is that teachers in primary education kind of assume that their students are too young for these topics. They're too young to talk about these topics, they're too young to have issues with sexism or uh, discovering their sexual orientation or being confronted with gender norms. And this leads teachers to kind of see these issues as not, ve not very urgent and it's kind of okay to just put them on the wayside and focus on other stuff. When it comes to the boy-girl differences and how we handle these uh, things in the classroom, we see the teacher, some teacher biases popping up. So when we were talking about the stereotypical feminine characteristics and how they match uh, the behavior we would like our students to do, uh, we actually see this mirrored in the way our teachers think. So we see that they have a higher expectations of girls in their classroom. They think they will perform better, that they will be 
more well behaved in the classroom and we see that boys are usually considered to be less school ready. So they are considered to be less immature um, and we see that they are also reprimanded more often. So one part of this, and this has been in discussion in the, in the um, uh, literature for quite some time, is okay, we do see that boys also tend to be more inattentive and disruptive. So is this reprimanding of the teachers, is it fair? Because they have been more disruptive? Or is it unfair and are they reprimanded more than they should be? Um, actually, research by uh, my colleague Als Consuegra has actually shown that it's also a bit of a bias and that boys do get reprimanded more often and more frequently than is actually fair. At the school level, um, so this is something which is also quite interesting. Uh, when we transcend the teacher level and we look at school policies and how cultures on, on, on schools are influencing both our teachers and our students, uh, we see once again uh, this difference between educational level. So when we ask about school policies, we see that in primary schools, a third of them says that working on an LGBT-friendly climate is not applicable. So we see once again the idea of our children are too young for these topics whereas in secondary schools less than two percent said that this was not an issue for them to work on but uh, as Wim has already announced uh, what is one very interesting thing about these school cultures is that we see when we look into the way schools and students think about LGBT issues and about uh, gender norms, we see that in schools that are more flexible with regards to these norms, all the students tend to have a higher well-being. So this is not only true for the LGBT students, but this is equally true for straight students, boys and girls, so, um, and students that do or do not uphold the gender norms. So what is the explanation or the possible explanation for this is that by broadening up these gender norms, it becomes acceptable for children to explore who they are without having to think too much about how will people evaluate me for trying out a ballet class? What will people think of me when I try to answer quite a lot in the classroom? Will it be uncool, etc.? So they can leave these considerations more to the side and fully explore who they are, which is positive for their well-being on um, the whole range of school. And then, of course, what can we do? Um, so there are a few things on the different, different levels of schooling that are uh, important to consider. So when we consider school policy, so the first thing as a, as a school administrator or as a faculty, you might want to consider are the rules and regulations you have in your school. So like Madeline had already been saying, mainstreaming gender into your uh, rules and regulations is of course very important. Having very clear anti-bullying policies that include sexual orientation and gender, but also think about and reflect about about how gender norms are uh, interwoven throughout your rules and regulations. And then we're, for instance, talking about um, dress regulations for girls, which are usually about um, um, preserving a kind of modesty. And the, the messages you are implicitly giving to your students about that. Um, a second aspect to consider is infrastructure. Then we're, for instance, talking about gender-neutral bathrooms for transgender students. But we're also talking about such small things such as having a, a poster of the Holy Bee phone for, for your students, very visible in the classroom. It's uh, at the same time um, conveying a message of support and of acceptance. And these small things can really make a difference to the climate and the culture at your school. Uh, when it comes to curriculum, of course, we're talking about the content of your classes. Um, and then we're talking about being aware of gender issues. Like, for instance, when we discuss the Holocaust, we're not just talking about the annihilation of the Jewish community, but we're also talking about the annihilation of the LGBT community at the same time and about what happened to the Roma. So there are a lot of things to take into account there. It's also about being aware of... Um, female researchers throughout the times, female writers, etc., integrating these things into your 
curriculum. And it's also about illustrations. Um, this is something that Tom has already said at the start, and it's definitely true, um, that it's, it can be quite interesting slash um, horrifying to check our textbooks on stereotypes. And then I'm not just talking about gender stereotypes, but also how is diversity in a broad sense represented in our school books. Are there disabled people present there? Are there people of color? What are the age differences portrayed and in what role are people cast are important things to consider when um, analyzing your textbooks. And then of course, class practice. Um, so a first thing that has been very present uh, throughout the morning is awareness. So pressing the pause button and thinking about it because um, we all have these biases. Because we have all grown up in a society that has specific ways of thinking about gender and men and women, um, we all have these things ingrained into our minds. So it's always important to also reflect upon your own actions and what you're doing and be continuously aware um, because the teacher biases that we see are things that are happening unconsciously. Because if you would ask teachers about it, they would say, I, ha I treat everybody the same. It's things that we are not aware of. But it also makes it into things that are very hard to change. And that is why we have to be continuously uh, aware of reflecting. One thing that might be actually quite easy to integrate into our lessons is being aware of gender mixing. Because one of the things we quite often and quite easily do is do the boys versus girls thing when we want to group students. Um, and it's something that's actually not a very positive thing to use because you kind of implicitly say this is a grouping method that is a normal and good thing to do because you know you are so different that we're going to put you into two different groups because that works the best way. And implicitly you are continuously um, affirming the fact that men and women are so different they have to be put in different groups. So. Um, these and other things, there's a lot of stuff already present, so I'm going to end my, uh, my lecture here and thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Wendelin. It was, uh, again, I think very inspiring. A lot of different topics came in this uh, lecture. I was wondering if there were any questions from the audience, again, you can ask them in Dutch, it's no problem. <laughs> Be patient. <laughs> Hi, Wendelin. Hey. Um, I just have a question. Yeah, um, but what do you think about uh, mixing, uh, for example, sports lessons in secondary school? Because there are a lot of mixed um, yeah, uh, um, beliefs about it. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering what you uh, think about it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's something that we see quite a lot. So the physical education is split up. To be honest, I was also split up. Um, so one of the things that is usually said is boys have more muscle biologically than women. And that's why we have to split them up. Um, I think one of the responses you can give to this is that there is a lot of variation between or within the sexes as well. So I think the variation between the boys and the variation between the girls will be to a certain extent that you can still put them together and just evaluate everybody um, according to that. I'm, I'm, I have to say that I'm not um, an expert on PE uh, and on the biological differences between men and women, but I do know that some teachers have different evaluation criteria for boys and girls, but I don't see why you could not still evaluate according to that if that's what law and science dictates. But I don't see any enforcing reasons why you would have to split them up because there's going to be variation anyway so okay and you see that for all kinds of sports all kinds of types of activities they do in in physical education um well 
what we see is that when it comes to um, muscle and endurance, I think men usually tend to outperform women. But on the other hand, when it comes to gymnastics and things that are about being limber, we see that women tend to outperform men. So I don't think that if you would put them together that you would have or end up with the fact that the boys are always winning because it depends on the activity that you're doing. So in that respect, I don't really see an issue because, yeah, we're all different and that's part of the difference. So it's okay to be different. Yeah. yeah, when I was in primary education, we were all together and then it was apparently still fine, so... Maybe it's not only with the physical aptitude, maybe it's also cultural with religion and so on. My daughter is in sixth um, primary school, mm -hmm. but she's growing very fast. And she received a message that, oh, look at her, she's, she's, bo she's got boobs. It's not so... Um, proper. It's not clean, yes. Oh, back. <laughs> She's got boobs, but she, she's only 11. Yeah. And the message is maybe if you are growing, you are a temptation island. So we cannot put girls and boys on the same way. Yeah, we but, cannot, I'm not uh, agreeing with this, yeah. but we cannot avoid this because a lot of people are looking girls like temptation island. <laughs> and it's really a problem because yeah. It's not the way. This is actually very true. So when I was talking about the rules and regulations um, and the dress code that we usually have for girls in school, it's about this thing. It's about girls being the temptation island to the boys present in the school. And it's about, when, when I was in school, it was about not being allowed to wear spaghetti straps because you could see too much of the shoulders and I don't know what not. But the thing is, by continuously um, underlining these things, it's, it's, you give this message again and again about girls being a temptation to boys and as girls being a distraction to boys, because that's also something that's often said. But rather than um, punishing girls for having a body, I'd say we have to learn boys how to be respectful and just deal with that so, <laughs> because it's also if you if you really think it through it's it links very much to the gender-based violence that you see and it also links very much to rape myths and about girls asking for it because they wear a specific kind of clothing it's like the watered down version of that so i do think it's something we have to uh, go against to be honest Thank you very much for your inspiring speech. Um, I was wondering if you um, sometimes are in contact with uh, researchers who do the, the same kind of research on the French-speaking side of Belgium, and if you know about any specific uh, differences or similarities between the two regions. Um, I have to say that um, I know only one person, to be honest, on the other side. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the thing is, um, because like I, I said, it's, it's a European trend, so we do see the same things mirrored in Wallonia as we do in Flanders, so to that respect they're not that big of a difference. What you do see is the impact of the um, educational system. Oh. Sorry. So, for instance, um, in Flanders, we tend to use uh, B attestations quite a lot, which um, creates, well, or which um, makes that the students repeat years more often. Um, wait, let's see if I'm not mixing it up. Yeah, it's the other way around, isn't it? Yeah, okay, yeah. Oh, wait, I'm completely confused. I'm sorry. I'm going to. Take that again. So we do the B attestations more often and we ask them to change tracks. And in Wallonia, they use C attestations more often and they have to repeat years more often. So what we see uh, as a consequence of that is that students in uh, Wallonia do tend to get um, 
a diploma in general education more often, but they also tend to drop out more often. Whereas in Flanders, you see that they do um, tend to get their diploma, but they usually get it in vocational or technical training. And these are uh, mechanisms that are true for any disadvantaged group. So we see it in a small sense for boys, but we also see it definitely for ethnic minority students and for students with a lower socioeconomic backgrounds, that these are the hard point end results that these mechanisms lead to. I have a question, obviously. Um, how do you talk about gender or how do you talk about boys and girls without advocating uh, heteronormativity? Um, it's an important question, I think, because it's very present now. Yeah. yeah, that's definitely a good question and a good remark. So that's always a bit um, the balancing point that you go into. Because we are talking about gender norms and about stereotypical beliefs, it sometimes look, looks like we are reaffirming these things. And because we are focusing on the differences between boys and girls, we are once again looking at see how different they are. And it goes against the whole gender mixing thing that we want to do. Um, so how do you deal with that, I guess, is a bit the question. Um, so the thing is, um, from a research perspective, it's important that we are able to look to groups to be able to compare and to spot the disadvantages and the structural inequalities that are going on. Because if we are no longer able to look at different groups, we would, for instance, not see uh, the ways that our boys are, are having trouble right now in schools. So because of that, I'd say a categorical approach sometimes is definitely necessary. But at the same time, I do think it's always very important to keep on giving the message about the change that is possible, about uh, uh, flexibility and about the uh, relativity of gender norms and how we can uh, continuously challenge and change them. So it's a bit a balancing act, I'd say. Yeah.